In their first month at school, these six-year-olds learn a system of arithmetic utterly strange to their parents. Before they leave school, this new approach to mathematics will widen to prepare them for the computer, the new machine which promises or threatens the mind with what the Industrial Revolution did to the muscles. This week, Four Corners asks, when this circuit learns your job, what are you going to do? To many, Duntroon in recent years has become something of a military anachronism, a cosy haven for Colonel Blimps turning out tin soldiers in the same mould. But recently, there's been a change in step. Since last year's scandal over bastardisation, the college is undergoing changes that are dragging it slowly, if reluctantly, into the 70s. For Duntroon, the final outcome will make or break it. So while the state of the war may have improved, the end of the war is not demonstrably closer. I've spent the last four weeks in Vietnam with cameraman David Brill and sound recordist Bob Sloss. Here is our report. Between us and the hill is a small Cambodian village. The villagers are frightened, they have no way of knowing, they are not the targets. Then a Vietnamese helicopter arrives to remove us from the battlefield. It makes the war seem all the more unreal. going home and they're happy. Australia's 3rd Battalion withdraws from the task force base camp among the rubber trees at Nui Dat. They thought they'd be here for 12 months. Now they head home after only seven because the Australian government has decreed that most of its troops will be home by Christmas. Fung Tai Ba had her leg amputated three years ago. Today, she's about to walk again, with a new limb to replace the leg shattered by a stray bullet. It wasn't till earlier this year that her mother heard about rehabilitation for civilian war victims. So she was brought to this center in Saigon, where in the past year alone, more than 3,000 casualties have been fitted with new limbs. Fung Tai Ba is too young to realize that she'll be relying on a plastic limb for the rest of her life. Xuanlok was once a city of 38,000 people. Today, it's a deserted ruin. For five days before we arrived here, an average of 2,000 shells a day were lobbed into the city. 
and what the communists didn't destroy in their efforts to take the town, the South Vietnamese did in their efforts to keep them out. While their officers fired shots into the air, Vietnamese soldiers clawed their way past refugees, journalists and their own wounded comrades to get on board and away from Swan Lock. With considerable courage, cameraman Les Wisely turned his camera on and clutched it under his arm as we made our third attempt to get out on a chopper. If this was victory at Swan Lock, God knows what defeat would be like. Tonight, the presses are rolling on Australia's first national Sunday newspaper. The newspaper is one more link in the vast chain of a rapidly expanding newspaper, television and publishing empire. The man well, sitting on top of this empire is Rupert yeah, Murdoch, well, uh, at 40 yeah. years of age, fast becoming as influential and powerful as fellow yeah, colonial yeah. newspaper okay, tycoons yeah. Beaverbrook and Thompson. Hello, how are you? This week, the new Tsar of Fleet Street, often assailed by critics for his ruthless, sensational yeah. approach to journalism, arrived in Sydney to launch one of his more sophisticated enterprises, the Sunday Australian. I'm not ashamed of any of my newspapers at all. And I'm rather sick of snobs who tell us that they're bad papers. You do have a reputation of being a fairly ruthless boss. Now, um, just how ruthless are you in your own opinion? I don't think I'm ruthless at all. And uh, I think that's entirely uh, um, something that's painted by people like yourselves. Imaginary or not, there's a strange degree of respect, or even fear, of Rupert Murdoch among his staff, even while he's thousands of miles away in Britain. There's talk that Mr Murdoch doesn't like radicals, more so radicals with beards, that he expects his staff to wear collars and ties and hates shorts. These drums are being dumped in the ocean because they're considered too dangerous to dispose of on land. Each of these drums contain potent tar residues from a chemical plant. Altogether, more than 7,000 gallons of these substances were jettisoned off Sydney one day last week. Now, on each occasion, these loads were dumped illicitly. Did money pass hands? Money transpired on each occasion, yes. This is in the form of a direct bribe? A direct bribe, yes. Can you tell me why you are now making this public at this point of time? Well, I think, the, uh, I think it's a public... I think the public should know about this. I think it's to the interest of the public. I think something should be done about it. I've been smoking these things for 20 years. I started as a teenager because in those days it was thought smart to smoke. And anything that was as strongly forbidden at school as smoking was, it was almost a capital crime, just had to be worth trying when one was away from school and free to smoke if one wanted to. And now 20 years later, I've burned my way through a quarter of a million of these things. The odd thing about it is that after 20 years and after a quarter of a million of them, I don't enjoy smoking. I don't smoke because I like it. I smoke simply because I'm an addict. In some articles, they've called you the Australian Amazon. Have they ever? Have they really? Yes, <laughs> in, in the Life article featuring your career. Well, that's pretty 
pretty dreary article. I can just imagine them using some tired old phrase like that. They'd probably think all Australian girls are six foot tall and deep chested and all that. The day began at 6.30, when the 10-month-old baby decided she was ready for some action. By 10.30, Delfina has breastfed the baby, dressed the children, made three beds, tidied two bedrooms, prepared breakfast for four, done the washing up, cleaned the bathroom, finished one load of washing, and mixed the powder paint as her contribution to the activities of community play school. So, in the first three and a half hours, She's done work she could be paid for professionally under several different industrial awards. For the duration of this working day, Delfina is wearing a pedometer for four corners. And by lunchtime, she's already covered a distance of two miles. Once upon a time, there was a nobleman who took as his second wife the haughtiest, proudest woman ever born. She was a widow and had two daughters as ill-natured as she. The conditioning no process begins early in life. By the time they're five or six, we've given our children some strange ideas about the nature of love and marriage. She could not bear the young girl's good qualities, for they made her own daughters seem even more hateful. She made the poor girl do the filthiest housework. To them, it's more than likely about a handsome man who, after amazing feats of bravery, wins the hand of a fair princess. Or perhaps the man is a prince in disguise and the girl of lowly birth. Physical attraction is usually the single foundation of this relationship. And after the wedding has been celebrated at a grand banquet, no one imagines for a moment that the end to such a story could be anything other than a lifetime of happiness. And a few days later, there was a grand wedding in the garden of the palace, to which everyone for miles around came, and they were happy ever after. I was just terrified of dying, and I knew... This is a group therapy session at the Sydney Rape Crisis Centre. Women who've been raped talk freely and try to overcome the trauma. It may have happened years ago or yesterday. Did you not resist? Uh, you know, no, not, I didn't resist. Yeah. And so when you go to the police station, that's taken <laughs> as, you know, you must have consented because you Even haven't got bruises. Even though he had a gun. And, yes, that's right. They, they still were. expected some token resistance, I believe. Nobody knows how many women are raped in Australia. Experts say just one case in ten is reported. In Sydney, prisoner 134 walks out of jail. He has served nearly two years of a seven and a half year sentence for rape, assault and robbery. He claims the law got the wrong man. Now he's on parole. Any man can be a rapist. Um, your next door neighbour can be a rapist. Um, in fact, uh, really, I suppose every man is to a degree. Uh, he sees a girl walking down the street and he imagines immediately uh, or what he would like to imagine. And to himself, he is raping her. You know, there are some men who go a step further because they want to see just how far they can go. I believe that a lot of men just uh, do it for the thrill, for the, uh, the idea of uh, adding a conquest to, the, to their list. Uh, they're not really worried whether or not the girl consents, of course. How do you think the rapist regards his victim? Well, he doesn't regard his victim as a human being, for a start. Were you uh, flattered when the Kremlin described you as the Iron Lady? Flattered? No, but it's not a bad title to have. I was mad as a March Hare as well. I don't mind people saying that. Do you think The Female Eunuch was a, an influential book? I honestly don't know. I don't know what sort of influence books have. I think it gave a, a form to things that people were already feeling, but whether it made them feel that, I don't know. I mean, when anybody says to me, your book changed my life, I always sit them down carefully and say, now look here, if you go around saying that, your life hasn't changed at all because you're still putting responsibility onto somebody else for what you've in fact done. I didn't change anything. I wrote a book. A book is a lot of black marks on white paper. What happens after that? It's something beyond my control entirely. I refuse to accept responsibility apart from anything else. I mean, if women are leaving their husbands right, left and centre, which appears to be happening, it's not my fault. <laughs> The ancient rhythms of the sing-sing are compelling and hypnotic. Centuries fall away. 
the earth moves under the feet of thousands of warriors. By tradition, fighters, cannibals, and sorcerers, using for currency the pig, for justice the spear and the arrow, on December the 1st, they must become the politicians, public servants, plumbers, publicans, mechanics, and shopkeepers of self-governing New Guinea. The first Australian club, Swingers International, which is connected in name only to its American counterpart, was formed two years ago. It's headquartered above a hairdresser's shop in Randwick, Sydney. In the past 12 months, the organisation has had 5,000 inquiries, 75% from married couples, 25% from single people. Its administrator, Ray Burton, describes the organisation as a sexual liberation movement aimed at providing a service to help fulfil the needs of sexually adventurous male and female adults. So far, he claims 600 members. Uh, if people did have an honest approach to sex, there would be no need for an organisation such as Swingers International at all. It's obviously difficult to get to know anyone within just a couple of days, even someone as candid and as frank as Ronald Biggs is. But nevertheless, you get some fairly strong impressions about the man. He's obviously very intelligent, and yet, in a strange way, he's a simple man. What, what was it worth to you, the robbery? Well, a lot of grief, I guess. But money. In, but in money, uh, about 125, 130,000 pounds. The paradox of Queensland is its premier. Steering the fortunes of the hard-drinking, big-gambling pioneers of the North is a man who drinks one glass of beer a year, and he would no more bet on a horse than glance at a copy of Playboy. He couldn't anyway since it's banned in Queensland. Mr. Bjorki Peterson's enthusiasm for mineral development in Queensland goes far beyond mere political rhetoric, for the Premier himself has a personal interest in the development of the state's coal reserves. No, I think you, you, can, you shouldn't say a thing like that. You, I have no coal interests, all my family have no coal interests. I don't know what makes you say you ought to withdraw that. I, I, I wouldn't threaten you with a writ, but, but you shouldn't say it because it's not true. The new chapter of Australian political and parliamentary history is about to be written. This is the eve of the most important day in the life of Albert Patrick Field. He, of all the AOP faithfuls of Queensland, was the choice of Premier Bjorki Peterson to fill a vacancy caused by the death of the much-respected Senator Bertie Milliner. By general editorial consensus of Australian newspapers, it was a choice matched only by Caligula's to make his horse a consul. The soon-to-be Senator's rise from French polishing to affairs of state is close to unbelievable. A non-qualified non-entity, a blundering innocent. Just some of the phrases editorialists have used to describe Senator Albert Patrick Field. A weaker man would have found the abuse and criticism beyond endurance. At 65, undaunted, he's announced that he's ready to take the electoral plunge. Are you saying that it's not really a question of whether you act constitutionally? It doesn't matter. If you can save Australia from the type of people that we would have had if Mr Whitlam had got a majority in the Senate, the majority in the House, we would have been in a dictatorship. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. Gough Whitlam opens his campaign to become Prime Minister of Australia late Tuesday, November 11. A job he's been dismissed from just four hours before. What lies ahead is 30,000 miles of air travel and over 30 rallies in every capital city, plus vital country centres.
Uh, whether he did it directly, I don't know. Um, uh, or... It's a stylish way to travel. The meals are vastly superior to Reg Ansett's, and the Air Force stewards understand the special needs of journalists on the campaign trail. As rally succeeds rally, as press conference succeeds press conference, you begin to lose track of what the Odyssey is all about. But at least there's someone on board who claims he knows. I want this to be an election about issues, about policies, about the kind of future they want in Australia for themselves and for their children. That's what it ought to be about. that normally sedate and reserved Liberal audiences are giving Fraser is a new development in Australian election campaigns. In the past, the noise and the cheers were Labor's monopoly. These days, anything Labor can do, the Libs can do louder. It's a very wet Saturday afternoon at Bunga Beach on the New South Wales south coast. And this is the first view we've got of the area we've chosen to try to survive in. With me are five people who've been selected at random from the hundreds who first contacted us to come on this course. Our object is to try and see how perfectly urbanised man can survive in the bush with the very minimum of equipment. Halfway through the first week, it was becoming obvious that the first camp was a disaster. It was too cold on the ridge. The goanna, which blundered into our camp, represented the first real meal that any of us had had for nearly four days. Some of us were understandably squeamish about eating it. But so long as you ate it quickly enough and didn't think about it, it was tolerable. Mm. Good. The final score of rabbits was five, including a baby one, which we took as a pet, which sat in silent disapproval as we consumed his relatives. A cup of black coffee and a nice big cigar. It's quite extraordinary today. For the first time, I actually resented the crew who were filming this coming in because they were so fresh and obviously had a good night's sleep from their beds and so on, and I sort of resented their intrusion. I'm coming to a stage now where I'm, I'm sick of rabbit meat and dandelions. I'm sick of going on the beach and hurting my feet every time I walk on the pebbles. I'm sick of smelling all the while, and other people smelling. In fact, come to think of it, I'm sick of talking to the camera as well. 